recording the warm up, but come on. There we go. All right, so that was that one. Questions, concerns? I'm going to move it over a little bit so that when I move over to the next question, it's still kind of there for anyone who needs to catch up a little bit. Alrighty then. Next one was a product rule because we have the natural log of 5x squared minus 7 times x squared plus 1. When you essentially have kind of two different situations of x showing up or whatever variable you're talking about, since these are multiplied together, product rule. So just to remind us of our product rule, that will be our f prime g plus f g prime, where the f and the g are the two pieces. So if we do the little chart thing that I like to do, natural log of 5x squared minus 7x squared plus 1, we need the derivative of kind of both of those pieces. The derivative of the natural log thing is going to be another chain rule. Outside function is that natural log piece. The derivative of natural log of something is 1 over that thing. So we have 1 over 5x squared minus 7, but then our chain rule says to take the derivative of that something. So the derivative of 5x squared will be 10x. The derivative of 7 is 0. So I'll write it for about two seconds and then erase it. The 10 is coming from the 5 coming along for the ride and the 2 coming down from the power rule. I'm going to erase the 0 now. Derivative of x squared plus 1, 2x plus 0. So I'm just not going to write the 0. Put it all together. I'm going to put that 10x in the numerator because you can. If you don't want to and you just want to leave it separate, that's fine. But I have my f prime times my g plus f times g prime. There's not a ton we could do to simplify this. Honestly, any rewriting is not going to make it any simpler, so I would just leave it. Questions, concerns? I see some people writing, so I'll hold on for a couple seconds. leave much of it in there so I need to scroll over a lot for this one. Last one was a pro, uh, quotient rule which in general is going to be our f prime g minus f g prime all over g squared. Your f is always your numerator in these cases the quotient case and then we have x plus one to the fifth f prime g prime Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Since it's not anything more complicated than an x, we don't need a chain rule. Here we do need a chain rule for the x plus 1 to the fifth because x plus 1 is quote unquote more complicated than x. So the outside function here is essentially that fifth power. So we do the power rule, bring the power down, subtract 1 from the power, but that inside stays itself, stays itself the same. Whatever. Then we have to multiply by the derivative of x plus 1. Derivative of x is 1. Derivative of 1 is 0. So it would just be 1, which technically means I don't need to write it, but I'm going to keep it there to remind us that it was a chain rule and it existed. In my final answer, I'm probably going to drop it, but just for this piece, I'll keep it there. So then f prime times g minus f times g prime. Oh, I forgot to write g squared. I always kind of forget to do it in the chart, and I just kind of do it at the very end. But we would have x plus 1 to the fifth all squared. You could leave it like that, or you can rewrite it as x to the one pl x plus 1 all to the tenth. Which is what I would do, but whatever floats your boat. 
So these ones had, we had a product rule and a quotient rule, and both of those had chain rules inside of them. You don't have that situation going on on the quiz, which is why this is a hair more difficult than your quiz. You do have chain rules on the quiz, but they're not inside of a product or a quotient rule. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions on this one really quick? Going once, going twice. We've got an e to the something, right? And that 10 in front doesn't really matter. That just comes along for the ride. The first thing we deal with, just rewrite that 10, comes along. Since that exponent on the e is more complicated than just an x, this is going to be a chain rule. So what's our outside function? We technically have an e to the, you know, something. So what's the derivative of e to the something? e to that thing. But then our chain rule, so remember our chain rule, da, 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 da. derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside times the derivative of the, whoops, derivative of the inside. So at this point, we've essentially taken care of the f prime g piece, but then we need to multiply by the derivative of kind of that exponent. So the three essentially comes along for the ride. And when I do a power rule on the X to the fourth, bring the power down, subtract one from the power. I can't reach because I'm too tiny. <laughs> um, and then I multiply the three and the four together to get the 12. And then if you want to, you can take an extra step. I did an extra step of taking this 10 X, this 10 and this 12 X cubed and multiplying them together to get the 120. Any more questions about the warm up? All righty. Then check four. Where? Oh, did I not pull it up yet? One moment, please. <laughs> I apparently didn't have it pulled up yet. So on Monday, we started talking about chapter four. It's all about finding maximum and minimum values. The one main thing that we're going to be using a lot is kind of this relationship between F and F prime. If the derivative is positive, then the original is increasing. If the derivative is negative, the original is decreasing. So we defined what it meant to be a local min or a local max. Whoops. And then we did this kind of generic kind of get an idea in here once it catches up with me. So we looked at this graph and then we kind of looked at what the derivative was doing to the sides of these maxes and these mins. And what you notice is that the derivative kind of changes sign in either case. In one case, in the minimum case, it changed from negative to positive. And then in the max case, it changed from positive to negative. That's essentially what we're going to use to be able to find these kind of algebraically. So we're going to not have to have that graph, and we're just going to look at the derivative and kind of see what it's doing. So that's where we're at. We've got a bunch of definitions to write down first, so here we go. So for any function f, a point in the domain, so point p, we're specifically talking about the point p, um, in the domain where the derivative at p equals zero. That zero kind of got a little too big and ran into the other thing. <laughs> so the derivative at p equals zero. Or f prime of p is something we say undefined. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. This is called a critical point. Note that somewhat unfortunately, the point P F of P is also referred to as the critical point. 95% of the time, if they say critical point, they just care about the X value. Anytime I ask for the critical point, 100% I only care about the X value. Or if I want the Y value, I will be very, very specific about wanting it. Sometimes f of p is referred to as the critical 
value. So that y value can sometimes be referred to as the critical value instead of the critical point. A theorem, which is just something that's true if you've never encountered a theorem before in your life. <laughs> well, you have, you might just not have heard it called a theorem. Anyway, if a function continuous on the real line, which just essentially means every function we're going to really care about, has a local max, maximum I'll say, or a local minimum. Well, I guess not every function we consider. Like 98% of the functions we consider are continuous. So if we have a local max or a local min at P, then P is a critical point. Which is kind of the meat and potatoes of how we're actually going to be able to do this. So that is, if F has a local max or min at X, that essentially means that the derivative at that x value is going to be zero. Now, I also said that critical points could be that the derivative is undefined. That's, I want to say never, but I'm going to say rarely ever just in case, but I'm like 99% sure it never happens. Um, the undefined ones are going to be points of interest, but they are pretty much never a max or a min. So that's why I can kind of just pull out the f prime of zero one, f prime equals zero. The converse of this statement, converse just means like the opposite thing, the backwards thing. So the converse of this statement is not true. So what I mean by that is that a function can have a local, uh, nope, nope, sorry, sorry, a critical point. But not a local max or min. So just because it's a critical point does not mean it's a max or a min. If it's a max or a min, then it's a critical point. But if it's a critical point, it doesn't have to be a local max or a min. Hold on for a couple seconds for people to get that down. For the sake of time, because I want to make sure we get to one actual full example, I'm going to skip this example one because it's kind of a baby example and we'll kind of do it as like a warm up on Friday. So the next thing we'll do is we'll write down the process that we're going to follow and then we'll do one full example. We should definitely have time for that. OK, cool. So I'll hold on a few more seconds. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Kind of. So again, we're going to skip this example one. We'll come back to the starter on Friday. So to find local extrema now. Oh, I forgot to say this. Now I got to go back up for a second. I forgot. I said I would talk about undefined again, and then I forgot to talk about undefined. Hello. A function can be undefined in a lot of different ways. For the sake of our class, the only thing we're going to need to worry about is when a denominator equals zero. So if we take the derivative and the derivative has the denominator, like it was a quotient rule or something like that, then we're going to have to make sure that that denominator is not zero. So we're going to have to take the denominator, set it equal to zero. Any numbers that make that happen are going to be critical points. 95% of the functions we'll deal with don't have denominators, but if they do, that's what we'll consider. Again, there's a ton of other things that make functions undefined. We're not going to worry about them. <laughs> so, process for finding local extrema. And by extrema, can I scroll down the tiniest bit more? No. The word extrema is just a word to say essentially max and min at the same time. Instead of having to say local max and min, I can just say extrema. So the process we're going to follow is the following. We're going to find the derivative. Derivative. We're going to set that derivative equal to zero. And determine if it's ever undefined. 
So if it has a denominator, we're going to set it equal to zero. If it doesn't have a denominator, we're going to forget about it. This is what finds us our critical points. The reason we do that is because we know that if we have a max term in, it must have been a critical point. So let's find all our critical points and then figure out which one of them actually are maxes and mins. Now there's two ways we can figure out if it's a max or a min. We're going to talk about one of them today and one of them on Friday. They're called the first derivative test and the second derivative test. So you can either use the first derivative test, which we'll talk about in just a second, and that's suggested. And I'll explain why the second derivative is uh, test can be a little iffy when we get to it on Friday. So the first derivative test is usually a suggested way to go about it. The second derivative test can be a bit easier but sometimes it doesn't work, <laughs> which is why it's not as suggested. <laughs> but we'll get to that on Friday. So the first derivative test for finding local min and max is suppose P is a critical point. So essentially these three steps up here, well, the first two, because the third one is do something else. Those first two steps you will always do no matter which test you're using. But anyway, so say we have our critical points P. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a number line a lot of this might sound really weird, and when we do the example, hopefully it'll be like, oh, that's what she meant. <laughs> We're going to create a number line and label the critical point values on it. We're going to choose a point. From each section of the number line, so essentially once we plug in our critical points onto it, it's kind of going to break it up into little pieces. You're going to plug these into the derivative. The derivative. The derivative. The derivative. The derivative. The derivative. Plug it in to the derivative. And now you're going to remember because I just said it about five million times like an idiot. But people always <laughs> plug it into the wrong spot. So plug it into the derivative. And then we're going to essentially just look at whether it's positive or negative. We don't give a flying crap what the number is. We just care about whether it's positive or negative. This number line. I will start referring to as a sign chart or number. I'm probably going to use number line and sign chart interchangeably. <laughs> but we're going to use essentially that number line to determine if each critical point is a local max, a local minimum, or neither. So critical points don't need to be maxes or mins. So it could be neither. Well, hold on for a second so people can catch up. How are we going to figure out if it's a max or a min? Essentially, what's going to happen is we're going to have these, you know, we're going to have a number line. So this is like two options of a number line. We're not going to have multiple. Well, for one problem for the thing we're looking at, we're just going to have one number line. But essentially, you have two options at each critical point. Either, well, you have three options, sorry, because it could be neither. But these are going to be the max or the min cases. And if it's neither, I'll explain that in a second. So if the derivative, so these are kind of derivative number lines. So if the derivative changes from negative to positive, the other thing I personally like to do is I like to draw little line segments to remind me what that means about the original function. If the derivative is negative, that means that the original function is decreasing. And if the derivative is positive, that means my original function is increasing. So my little number 
my little line segments now hopefully make it kind of clear that we would have a min there. So if the derivative changes from negative to positive at a critical point, we're going to have a local min. Whereas if it kind of goes in the opposite direction, positive to negative, then the original function must have been increasing and then decreasing. So we must have had a local max at x equals p. So we're going to find a derivative, set it equal to zero, create a number line, find some positive negative values, then figure out if we've got max or min. We got just enough time to do one full example. So I'll wait a few seconds for people to catch up. So, all right. Oh, and so in a case where it doesn't change sign, if it's like positive and positive or negative and negative, then that's neither. So skipping past the second derivative test down to example three, if you're using my notes, Use whichever derivative test you like. Well, we only learned one so far, so we're going to use the first derivative test to find the local minimum and maximums of this function. X over X squared plus one. First thing we need is the derivative. Whoops. Which is going to be a quotient rule. Yay. Let me come off over here so that I don't necessarily run out of space and do my kind of quotient rule chart over here. So we've got x and x squared plus 1. Derivative of x is 1. Derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x plus 0. And g squared will be x squared plus 1 null squared. f prime g minus f g prime all over g squared. So 1 times x squared plus 1. So I'm not going to write the 1, but if you want to, you can. Minus f times g prime all over g squared. And this is where I kind of kept saying a while back that while you didn't have to simplify for chapter three, it's going to be helpful for us in chapter four. Well, here we are. So I want to simplify that numerator a little bit. I'm going to leave the denominator as it is. Simplify, foiling that out is not going to help me make this any easier. But I should probably simplify that numerator. So let me kind of pull it off to the side really quick and write just the numerator so that we remember that's what I'm doing over here. So I have x squared plus 1, and well, I don't, I don't need those parentheses, and then that will become a 2x squared, the x times the 2x. So then I have x squared minus 2x squared, so I'll have negative 1x squared, so this will reduce to 1 minus x squared, or if you wanted to write it as negative x squared plus 1, but I prefer the 1 minus x squared. So that means my derivative is 1 minus x squared over x squared plus 1 all squared. Questions on how I got that? OK. So we found our derivative. Now we have to find our critical point. So let me try to like remind us what step we're at. So we're going to find critical points. So that's either the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. So let me start with the derivative being zero. So I'd have, you know, this big nasty thing equals zero. To start solving that, I would want to multiply both sides by that denominator. But anything times zero is zero, so we essentially just end up with one minus x squared equals zero. You can also kind of take a shortcut for a fraction to be zero. A fraction, which we have here, is only zero when the numerator is zero. So if you just 
want to kind of jump to just setting the numerator equal to zero whenever you have a fraction, you can do that. But that's kind of why is that we multiply both sides by that entire denominator and it just kind of poofs. So add x squared to both sides. Square root. Remember when you square root something, you pick up a plus minus. So we'll have plus or minus one as our answer is there. We're done for f prime being zero. We have a denominator in this case, so we need to consider f prime of x undefined. Which I'll kind of just do off here. If you have a denominator, we need to consider this case. If there's no denominator, you can skip this step. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that denominator. I'm going to set that equal to zero. And see if that happens. If I wanted to solve this algebraically, maybe you already see where this is going. If you kind of already see in your head what the answer is going to be, you can just skip. But if we wanted to solve this, we would square root both sides. Plus minus zero is just zero, so I can just drop the plus minus. Subtract one from both sides. Then I want to square root a negative. Well, technically possible in the world of mathematics, not in this class. So you can't take the square root of a negative number in this class. You get an imaginary number. So this never happens. So we don't get any extra critical points from that piece. You might also just recognize that if you have x squared plus one, x squared is always positive. So you're going to have a positive number plus one or zero plus one, which is one. So you're, that's never good. If you recognize that too, you can kind of just skip it. But anyway, that's the algebra. All right, let's skip. <laughs> let's hurry up and do the last bit of this. We've done most of the meat of potatoes. So scroll down, please. Oh, I've run out of space. So essentially at this point, you want to do our number line. I'm going to write F prime next to it so I remember it's a derivative number line which is also going to remind me to plug them into the uh, derivative. I almost said denominator. Critical points are negative one and one. Plop them on the sign thingy. Pick some test points. What I mean by that is we essentially have like these three different sections here. So one of the sections is that middle section between negative one and one. Pick a number between negative one and one. Pick any number you want. I'm going to pick zero. You could be kind of funny and pick one half or negative one half or one fourth, but why? Why? Pick a number greater than one, any number at all. I'm going to pick five because I like it. I don't know. You can pick two, whatever floats your boat. Pick a number less than negative one. I'm going to pick negative five because I want to. It doesn't matter what number you pick. Because we don't care about what the actual we just care about the sign. Plug those into the derivative. Running out of time, running out of time. We're going to get 1 minus 0 is 1. Over 0 plus 1 which is one all squared, so that's one. One is positive, so we're going to put a positive on that piece. Sometimes once you get good at these, you don't even really need to figure out what the number is. You can kind of just tell whether it's going to end up being positive or negative. If I plug in five, we're going to get one minus 25, so that'll be negative 24 all over Whatever the heck 26 squared is. But this is what I mean. I don't know what 26 squared is, but I'm going to have a negative divided by a positive. That's going to be less than zero. I don't even care what the number is. So I plug that was for five, so we have a negative there. Plugging in negative 25 is actually going to give me the same thing. Negative 24 over 26 squared. Still don't know what that is, but it's less than zero. So we have a negative at that piece as well. Last tiny thing, which means we're decreasing, then increasing, then decreasing. And I'll kind of go over this um, 
kind of answer piece again on Friday, just to clarify, because I know I'm breezing a little bit. So we will have a local min at x equals negative one and a local max at x equals one. So I'll go over that kind of last, the reason why they're the max and min, I'll kind of reiterate that again. The 26, did I do something stupid? No, I didn't. Okay, so when I plug in five, Catherine, um, we're plugging it in into the denominator is x squared plus one. So five squared is 25 plus one is 26. Questions, concerns? Again, we'll kind of go over it again. And we'll do 